Hello, Park City's family, and each one of you who is tuning in today. I am very honored to be given the opportunity to preach God's word to the entire church family today. Maybe you are wondering, who is this new teaching pastor, and, and why is he preaching? Well, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Jeff and the leadership of our church for giving me this privilege. Pastor Jeff has been working nonstop since this pandemic started. So he gets a week off of preaching, but not of working. He's working really, really hard. Friends, I would have never imagined that I was going to convey the first message in front of you, in front of a camera. I never thought that. I was looking forward to see all your faces and to interact with you and to give you hugs. But you know what? I was able to do that during the reception that you hosted for my family and I about two months ago. We felt welcome. We felt cared for. Thank you, church. So who is Rolando? Who is this new guy? Where I, I am a child of God, redeemed by his grace. I am married to the love of my life, Janet. And out of that love, we have two wonderful children. Selena, she's 13, and David, he's 10 years old. They are Colombian, Mexican, American. So imagine that mix. I grew up in Colombia, and I was born to a Christian home. My father was a bivocational pastor as he worked for the government, and also he served at church. My mother was a Sunday school teacher. She was a choir member. She was always involved at church. My sister and I grew up in a very difficult time in our nation, but also in a very difficult time for our family. My mother, she was diagnosed with cancer when I was six years old. God taught us many life lessons, and today we're still honoring the Lord for what he did during those years. When I was nine years old, on my mom's bedside, she led me to Jesus. Uh, she wasn't able to read, so I was reading the Bible to her, and she explained to me what salvation meant. I gave my life to Jesus, and after that, I was baptized. I was 12 when she died, and even though we prayed for healing, she was healed. She went to heaven to be with the Lord. I was doubtful about my faith, and I was resentful, but the Lord got a hold of me. And then he called me to ministry. At, at one point, I thought I was going to become a medical doctor, but you know what? God called me to the ministry, and he opened the doors for me to come to the United States to attend Bible college in 2001. I got married had children, and lived in far Texas. Many of you know where that is located, in South Texas. Most of this time, I lived in South Texas. I worked for a children's home as a missions coordinator. That was the first time I had contact with Park Cities. Then I was a supervisor. While that time, God called us to establish, to start a Spanish ministry in a local congregation, Calvary Baptist Church in McAllen, Texas. It grew to become an awesome ministry that is reaching many people for Christ in the Rio Grande Valley. Recently, God called us to join Park Cities, and it was a decision that required much prayer, meditation, fasting. It was about a long process, about a year process, to be able to come here. We responded in, in obedience to the Lord. We felt that God was calling us to come here, and we left everything we have known to come here, and we are convinced that God called us to Park Cities. My passion is discipleship, leadership development, and evangelism. I love to make disciple makers for the glory of God among the nations. And we are very excited to see what God is already doing at Park Cities. And we are looking forward with anticipation to what he has in a store for all of us in the days ahead. Let me ask you a question. Who are we? More specifically, who are we in Christ? This is the resounding question that many believers are wrestling with today. And this is precisely our topic for the sermon series entitled Identity. Who are we in Christ? Discovering this. So let me start with this propositional question. Are we enough to live this Christian life? Are we enough? Well, today we are looking at a passage where the Apostle Paul addresses the home churches in Rome. 
Let's read the first verses of Romans chapter 5. I'm going to invite you to open your tablet or your phone or, or your Bible right there where you are. And this is what the Word of God says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does it put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I love this passage as it talks about a clean slate for us as believers. Romans 5 introduces a new section. Paul addresses this letter to the church in Rome, a group of Gentiles and Jews. He spends the four chapters talking about salvation, the first four chapters talking about salvation and justification. In a sense, the what and the how of salvation. What does salvation mean? How does it look like? And how does it work? He tells us basically that human beings are self-destructive and left to ourselves, we become self-consumed. We begin to abandon any notion of a God that is greater than us, that is bigger than us, and in control of all the details of our lives. So placing your hope in yourself or in any other human being is a fruitless, futile, and hopeless process, an impotent act of love. And here is where Jesus steps into the picture. Here is where Jesus dies at the cross to save us from our sins. And he raises at, and he raises again from the dead to give us his salvation. So Jesus dies for every human being in the face of the earth. He dies for all the people, for all the people, for every people group. Pantata ethne, that's the Greek word. For the gospel is, is therefore cross-cultural and is transformational. The climax of this context and this argument is found in chapter 3. Paul says that salvation is for all the people. And now you mention, well, in our Western 21st century mindset, you say, well, that's, that's okay. You know, salvation should be for everybody. Well, <laughs> in Paul's days, it wasn't for everybody. It was a revolutionary stand. It was like heresy. You know why? Because you have to remember that Paul lived in a place and a time in the first century Mediterranean world where the gods of that world were basically tribal gods. And a tribal god will take care of the people that worship that god. So for the Hebrew people, Yahweh was their tribal god. And Yahweh was going to take care of them. So who were the pagans? Who were the infidels? Who were those? They were the Gentiles. For them, it was the Gentiles. So in the climate of this argument, Paul states in Romans 3, 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You heard this passage multiple times. I grew up at church and I learned it growing up. But constantly, this passage is taken out of context. If you look at it at, at the context, what Paul is saying is he's talking about the Jews, the differences between Jews and Gentiles in reference to salvation. So he explains this in Romans 3, 22 to 24. He says, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For all have sinned, Jews and Gentiles, Texans, Americans, Colombians, Asians, Africans, people from the metropolis, from North Dallas, and even from poor cities. We have all sinned. <laughs> we bring nothing to our salvation. It is solely and purely by grace and grace alone. So in those days, there was a group called the Judaizers. 
This group was crazy. They, they wanted to add the law to salvation. They basically said that you need a Jesus plus following the law. That's crazy. I, I can't do that. But they thought that they, were, they wanted to impose these rules and regulations in the people to follow Christ. So let's translate it to our 21st century. We have to be honest that sometimes we believe the same. You know, we believe that if we do the right things, that if we have the right knowledge, that if we know the right people, that if we have the right set of beliefs, we are saved. But the reality is that we are not enough. We have all sinned and we are disqualified. Then in the last verse of chapter 4, Paul summarizes the first Four chapters. You don't want to read the first four chapters. This is the summer. This is what he says. He says, Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. <laughs> and justification is a fancy theological word that means the process of being saved. That's what it means. And I, I like another definition that says, just as says, I have never sinned. I love that one. God is looking to me through Jesus as if I have never sinned. So this is the process. And in chapter five, Paul starts to describe the consequences of this saving ad. So the next question is, so what? What does it mean on Monday morning? What does it mean for, for the here and now? What impact does it make in my life today? We understand that when we die, we go to heaven, but Christianity is more than just going to heaven. It is more than a ticket to go to heaven. It is life here and now. So Paul starts to describe this in chapter 5, and the first thing that he mentions is there is hope in Jesus. The first gift for the here and now of our salvation is hope. Jesus gives us hope. This makes a huge difference in our lives. Paul continues to describe the type of hope that we have. In fact, the first four verses in chapter 5 are, cert are centered on this idea that we have hope in Jesus Christ. And the first thing he explains is that this hope gives us peace. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God is a gift conferred upon the believer who is justified. The power of death has been destroyed. The lust of fear has been destroyed. And then we have unbelievable peace. You can live your life in this world because you don't have to worry about your life in the next world. It's not that you want to die. Nobody wants to die. But, you know, what can you do to a person? Or how can you scare a person? Or disrupt the peace of a person who is no longer afraid of dying? The answer is nothing. You can do anything. You know, this peace gives us fulfillment of life. It gives us peace, incredible, incredible peace. God is referring to his shalom. His holistic, life-giving, and flourishing peace. And then he says that this hope also gives us joy. Joy for living. The second part of this verse says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So when we have Jesus, there is joy in your life because he gives you joy. It is a type of joy independent of life circumstances. It is an inextinguishable hope. It is a joy in our salvation, but also in our sufferings. In our sufferings? <laughs> is this a typo? Paul, uh, is Paul really serious? I mean, we, we get the first part, you know, we rejoice in salvation, but in our sufferings, well, he's saying this. There is a process here. Suffering brings perseverance. Perseverance builds character, and character fuels hope. However, when you look at the Greek word, the emphasis is not placed in the process. Sufferings, perseverance, character, hope. Suffering, perseverance, character, hope. It is the cycle we all go through in life, like it or not. The emphasis is actually on the one Greek word that means we know. 
The brilliance of that line, the power of that line is in the one Greek word that means we know. What Paul is saying is that we can rejoice because we know what will happen. You know, my mom, she loved the hymn entitled Because He Lives. We are familiar with this hymn, and Pastor Jeff reminded us of these lyrics during Easter Sunday. It says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth living because he lives. When my mom's cancer advanced to the point that she could not walk anymore, that she could not talk anymore, that she could not see anymore, she would sing and praise God. When the doctors brought negative news to the room, when the treatments didn't work anymore, when she was diagnosed with few days, but then she lived few more months, she lived because she knew of a God. She knew of a God who provides. She knew of a God who sustains, a God who is bigger than any terminal cancer, a God who has her family in his hands, a God who knew the future of her young children, a God who provided strength, peace, and comfort. Her eyes of faith would see what her eyes, what her natural eyes could no longer see. And this, my friends, this, my friends, is faith. It is in that we know of God that we are secured and we are protected. So when we see suffering coming, when we see trials coming, when we see temptations coming, when we see trouble coming, we can have peace and joy because we already know that he is at work. He will never leave us, never forsake us. Uh, this is a powerful promise. We know the end of the movie. Be, we can have joy because we know the ultimate goal of that suffering is going to build perseverance in our lives which is going to make us stronger in our faith, which is going to build hope again. It is the cycle. It is in the we know, because we know we can rejoice in him. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He is our daily provision. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He is our light. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. He is our protector. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He is our shepherd and we lack nothing. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is our eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way and the only truth in this life. Jesus said, I am the true vine. He is our only source for life. There is this scene in the movie, The Hunger Games where presidents know this evil character, you know, that is oppressing the people. He's talking to his lieutenant and he provides an excellent definition of hope. I'm going to read it. He said this, hope is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. It is fine as long as it is contained. Hope is the only thing more powerful than fear. A little hope if you want to keep people oppressed in Christian life. <laughs> A lot of hope is dangerous. Why? Because there is power in hope. And this is what Jesus is giving us in our salvation. This is what Jesus is giving us. But also, there is power in Jesus. Verses 6 to 8 are an attempt to explain the power that resides inside the gospel story. The Apostle Paul says in verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then Paul says, in my own words, you might find someone that would die for a good person, but to die for the ones that are trying to kill you? Who does that? Only Jesus. The radical love of Jesus demonstrates this saving act. It is at his weakest moment when Jesus is hanging naked on the cross and he's bleeding to death that he's carrying the sins of the whole world. 
This is why Paul can say, in my weakness, I am made strong. You and I, in our weakness, we are going to become stronger. There is power in Jesus because he does something that no one else, no one else will do. That power is only found in the sacrifice of Jesus. A famous painter, Auguste Renoir, drew his famous paintings when he was suffering of extremely arthritic pain. One of his friends went to visit him and, and he asked him, you know, why did you keep painting? <laughs> he said this, because the pain passes, but the beauty remains. The pain passes, but the beauty remains. The suffering passes, but the glory of God is going to shine and is going to be shining in such a way that the remaining power of Jesus is going to be manifested in our lives. There is a problem in our lives today, and Paul alludes to that problem to the churches in Asia Minor, especially in Galatia. He talks about legalism. You know, what are some of the signs of legalism today? Well, working in our own power. Instead of letting the power of Jesus, we say, Christ's power plus my own power. I, I do it the way that I want it. <laughs> I have all the power. I have the, all the money. I have all the possessions. I have the education. You know what? <laughs> this is some signs of legalism. Working according to our own rules, to, to my own rules. It, this is Christ plus my own rules. Let me tell you, we have been accepted by him regardless of the rules we follow. It's okay to follow the rules. It's, it's good to follow the rules, but <laughs> we malign the gospel when we add to grace. We malign the gospel when we add to grace. Galatians 2, 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ so that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I love this scripture. Paul says, I was doing all these things, but it was no match for the pleasure of a gracious God who transformed my life. Remember that Apostle Paul, he had this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. The Samaritan woman had an encounter with Jesus and she was transformed. The blind man, everybody that had an encounter with Jesus, their lives were fully transformed and restored. Working to earn God's favor. You know, this is Christ plus my good works. I am so good. <laughs> well, this is legalism. You know, God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance before him, but instead on his performance on your behalf. Let me repeat it again. This is, this is my phrase here. God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance before him, but instead on his performance on your behalf. It is not what you do, it's what God has already done for you. And this is the core truth of the gospel, that salvation is not about what men can do, but salvation is all about what Christ has already done. Thirdly, there is healing in Jesus Christ. Verses 9 to 11 reveal the consequences of God's salvation. The key word in those verses is the word reconciliation. It is used three times in these verses. Justification, you see, is a legal language. Reconciliation is a personal and familiar language. Verse 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. There is an idea of ultimate reconciliation here. For the Hebrew mind, the meaning of this word is rooted in the creation narrative, where God created Adam and Eve and they disobeyed God. So the idea is that one day God will come back and he will restore, he will bring back to him what he was originally his. He's going to make everything new. We have this hope and power with him. We were broken at the fall, but now we have this healing power. It is a kingdom realization. It is the here now and is yet 
to come. So how do you find this healing? It starts with five statements. These are powerful declarations. And I want to leave this with you. First one, I am broken. It is a confession statement. It is to look at yourself in the mirror and to say with all your heart, I know that I am broken. Second one, I am sorry. I am sorry for my part in that brokenness. And this gets more difficult uh, as we move on. Third one, please forgive me. Asking for forgiveness is only for the humble. Fourth one, please help me. This is one of the most complicated ones to say, to ask for help, to reach out to someone, especially during this time, to even admit that we need help. The last one, how can I help you? Once you practice this, you will find healing for your soul. Then you turn around and you say, how can I help you? It ends with healing. It all ends with service. God's healing power allows us to serve him even as broken vessels. So are you ready to be restored today? <laughs> if we all live by faith, by practicing the way of Jesus, by experiencing his power, his presence, and his healing, and his hope, we will be able to experience the fullness of shalom, of our salvation. So finally, are we enough? Of course not. We bring nothing to the table of salvation. Yes, we bring something. We bring our sin. We cannot earn or pay for our salvation. Jesus is enough. Jesus paid it all. Many of you know that our daughter, Selena, went through a very difficult trial last year. For about five years, she had these nodules around her thyroid gland, and, and uh, the doctors were very concerned, and they treated with medicine and monitored her during five years, to the point that one of them was, was very large. And the doctor said she needs to have surgery. So we ended up at the Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. You know, it was an extremely difficult time for our family. We prayed and fasted a lot, and it was tiring and long process. You know, after many biopsies and exams, the doctors had different opinions. One doctor took us to the extreme case of cancer in the first appointment. The other doctors would have a different prognosis. All concluded that she needed to remove, they needed to remove the whole thyroid and the whole thing to be safe. In all this process, we prayed, and, and the day of the surgery arrived. So we were there with Selena, and my, my wife and I, we hugged Selena, we prayed for her, and I whispered in her ear. I told her, Princess, you're not alone, God is with you. And she looked at me with those big eyes, and she said, that, Daddy, I'll be okay. She had been saying that for a long time during those years. I'll be okay, daddy. Don't worry about it. And yes, let's fast track. Months after, she's okay. She's okay. My friends, we will be okay. In the power of Jesus, we will be okay. So today, so today in the midst of the coronavirus, in the middle of 2020, we look at all kinds of possibilities, all kinds of horizons, and we place our faith in what we know. We know Jesus, and I would encourage you to live your life with the hope, power, and peace that can only be found through Jesus. I'm going to make an invitation to perhaps many of you who are tuning in for the first time, and, and you don't know Jesus, and, and you want to say just after me, by faith, just believing, you say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of all my sins. Lord, I recognize that I cannot live my life by myself. And I ask you to come to be my Lord and my Savior and to, to rule my life. Help me to follow you. I recognize that there is power in salvation. And today, I want to follow you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us know if you made this decision. Just send us a text message. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with another prayer for all of us. All of us who are believers. All of us who perhaps uh, need healing, power, and reconciliation today. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. You are a God who revealed yourself to us through your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the way that you love us, that you care for us. You love us with an unconditional, never giving up type of love. Help us, Lord, to cling to you and only to you, to cling into your promises. Lord, help us to be light in the midst of darkness, to be hope in the midst of turmoil. Help us to be one in you. Lord, we pray so that we understand that suffering produces character and character produces hope. But there is this type of hope that never perishes, that nothing will destroy. So today we ask that you are enough, that you become enough in our lives. Lord, let it be your kingdom, nothing else, nothing less, but your kingdom in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.